When I think of motherly love, I think of Mama, I think of my grandmother. It's always her. And as a toddler, she'd lead me out into her little patch of a backyard where these scraggly raspberry bushes were along the fence and she would go out there and pluck these raspberries one at a time and feed them. And I remember like a baby bird, I'd just hold my head up and open my mouth and she'd plop these warm raspberries in my mouth. I think the deep connection that we had was sharing stories. I, in fact, I remember her folding her hands and leaning over and go, so what happened in school today? She would truly actively and deeply listen. So I just told her every story that happened to me. I even told her about my imaginary friends. She would see me in there in the living room talking away. So who are your friends? And I explained that this was the big St. Bernard, there was the monkey and there was the kitten that were my friends. When I was around five years old, I learned how to cuss. And she said, you talk like that, I'm gonna scrub out your mouth with soap. And I was defiant. And she grabbed the ivory soap and she took that ivory soap and started in my mouth. And I was so defiant, I bit the bar of soap in half, chewed it up and spit it out on the floor. And she stopped, came back with the lye soap, put it in my mouth and I bit down and I caught on fire. I mean, and after that, I, I, I don't think I said a cuss word until I was 32 years old after that. I often use her as my conscience. You know, in the old Disney, Jiminy Cricket would be sitting on your shoulder, right? With me, it's Mamo. And I think if anything, what kept me from being a total ass is my grandmother's love. Because it's easy, especially after you get into Hollywood and you create a couple number one shows and you produce a hit movie, it's easy to become one of those guys. I never did, and I know it's because of her. And to this day, I really cannot tell a lie. I have a little black booklet, and in it were notations like, so-and-so owes me 25 cents for the church. But then, as you go through, interlaced in those pages are all of her prayers, written in her beautiful cursive. And these were not formal prayers. It was prayers like, please watch over my grandchildren. And if I ever need to be inspired, I just grab that little booklet and kind of hold it between my hands and I feel like I have her energy. In the eighth grade, when I had my confirmation in the Lutheran Church, the next morning, she came out to our house and said, I want to talk to you. Took my hand, we sat there and said, she said, I listened to you at your confirmation and I believe you have a pastor's heart. And if you are willing to work hard in high school and make good grades, I'll save all the money I can and I will pay for your college to make sure that you become a Lutheran minister. And I went, no way, a minister, no way. I don't want to do that. I, want, I got girlfriends and parties and I, I, you know, I want to get a driver's license. So all through high school and college, I kind of lost track of her because I got so busy. I got my driver's license, I had parties, I had sports, I had girlfriends. And so as I went into undergraduate school, my senior year of high school and into undergraduate school, she would pay me $5 to come and mow her grass. And it's a little bitty yard. And I realized much later that I wasn't there to mow grass. She was asking me to do that so she could see me. And the last time I saw her, I had mowed her grass and I was getting ready to leave for graduate school in New Orleans. In that same little backyard where I ate the raspberries, she was standing on the back porch and she had picked some and she was holding it. And I finished and I looked up at her and I realized, wow, the cancer is really making her skinny. She had lost 20 or 30 pounds. And she said, before you leave, you wanna come in and have a bowl of vanilla ice cream and I'll put the raspberries on it. And I said, oh, mama, I'm, I'm too busy. I gotta go and, and I had things to do. And she said, okay. She looked at me with such tenderness and such longing that I had to turn away. And I said goodbye and I left. Packed up, went to graduate school. About three, four months later, I got word she had died. And my family said, are you coming up for the funeral? I said, well, uh, I can't. I'm a starving student. I can't afford travel. I'm, I'm teaching a class. I'm in classes. I have a rehearsal. 
I, ju I just can't make it. So I didn't go to this woman's funeral. And that always kind of stayed with me. And then when I was approaching my 70th year, I happened to wake up one night about two o'clock in the morning, wide awake. So I went down to my study and I thought, well, I'll think or pray. And I got my Bible and when I opened it, letters fell out of the cover and I picked them up and they were all from my mother. And then on the second page of this one letter, at the very bottom it said, I believe my mother was correct. You have a pastor's heart. And as soon as I read that, I felt Mama's spirit in the room. And I was afraid to move because I was afraid if I moved, it, she would go away. So I started to talk to her. And then I happened to notice that the sun was starting to rise. So it had been a while. I'd been sitting there. And so finally I went, I am so sorry. I didn't come to your funeral. I said, I'm sorry I wasn't there to honor you. Would you please forgive me? And in that moment, it was like weight lifted. And I went, okay, that's why she's here. I didn't even realize it was a weight I'd been carrying for almost 50 years. I had this epiphany that when I imagine God's love, it's her face that I see. My name is Matt. I'm one of the lucky ones.